This call is now being recorded. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our latest community call. It's good to have you this new time, and uh, hopefully it works for as many people as possible. And we will eventually hold possibly a second community call at a different time. So we have three small things on the agenda today. First of all, if you haven't taken a look yet at the Notion page, I'm going to share a link in chat here. But we are trying to develop a kind of a one pager. You, if you have tried to tell your friends what Research Hub is about, you might have noticed this struggle, how other people might not you know, in, initially get what is it about and what's the point in joining. So we are trying to put together a document where we, in a an eloquent and uh, elegant manner try to shortly explain what research hub is all about so it's open to crowdsourced comments i think patrick right everybody can uh, contribute to this document oh yeah definitely we want like as much background as possible in order to have like the information appeal to like all kinds of academics so yeah everybody like if you can contribute you know very welcome yeah so feel free to log in and uh go over it and edit as you want we try, try to make it as accessible to basically people around you as possible uh second we have we are happy to show a new designs for the editor program and i think kobe or thomas will help me with that right do you guys have something all right and lastly we, we for the editor program it's opening really soon and uh, we will need some sort of selection criteria if we do have a lot of volunteers unfortunately not everyone might qualify or will have opportunity to get them on board immediately at least and so we will need to come up with a mechanism of how we can uh, select those editors based on the input of all the active users that includes you so we need to discuss what would be the questions we need to ask, what would be the metrics we need to assess, or however we will handle this decision process. All right, let's start with the introduction. Uh, Patrick, do you think I should demonstrate the screen? Yeah, definitely, if you want to. That sounds great. I'm also happy to drive as well, if that would be easier for you. Uh, maybe if you could demonstrate the screen and I can Definitely. Lead the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> we'll pull it up now. All right. As you can see, it basically starts with a short mission statement, right? And that that part perhaps is not is not the most problematic, right? Because the general gist of research hub, I think, is conveyed pretty fast, right? So we accelerate the pace of scientific research, but you know, change the incentive structures and um, all that. The, would you like to add something here? Do you think the mission itself needs to be elaborated more to other people you would want to introduce to research hub? I'll give you a moment to read it first. <laughs> you know, a couple of things, uh, like in my mind, when I read it as a researcher, I always think like, you know, what does pace mean? Like accelerate the pace, because if you ask some researchers, uh, you'd actually say there's like too much coming out now. So they'd be, they'd be like, okay, like, are you, are you trying to even create even more research? Because it's 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 crazy how much research gets released, like even hourly now. It's it's true. It's absolutely true. And some people even use the term slow science, right? And uh, it, slowing science down can be a good thing when we, you know, do it in favor of you know more streamlined and uh, less noise, let's say, right? But I think that. The, the focus here is on the getting you know, picking up the pace without sacrificing the quality, without pumping out new product necessarily, right? So for example, if the revision process or the review process itself is faster, it doesn't necessarily mean that there will be higher demand or higher expectation for more 
publications, right? So each individual publication would be you know, published faster, but doesn't mean there will be more of them. Joey, thinking about like uh, what you know, tagline would appeal to either yourself or people in your field. Like this uh, phrase here, kind of has the most attention on the page. It draws your eye immediately. So, what do you think should be here? That would be a good like first sentence to set the tone for recruiting people to research hub. I think like for a lot of researchers, it's like uh, it's just like the pain of going through the whole process, right? Of like publishing a paper. Like you got, you get a draft up, which that goes like how many hours into it. And then you got to give it to this peer review committee that you don't know really who sits on it, except like the journal is on who decides this committee. And you get through that comment and then they get back to you like pages and pages and pages of edits. And then you go through all these edits and at the end of the day, it might come down to, you know, like we're just not feeling this topic this year because of X, Y, Z. And you know, all that, all that work is just, you're like, crap, okay, now I have to go reformat it for another journal. I think that's like the biggest pain in the butt for a lot of researchers. And it's like, I know I'm helping someone publish something right now. And I think she's tried like five journals and it's always like, you know, I don't know, it's, it's like, it's tough. It's actually really tough. And part of it is, yeah, you know, maybe her papers aren't as the greatest, but uh, you know, I guess, it comes down to the question, you know, what are we going to offer differently than the, the, the journals? And that's what I'm, uh, yeah, it's, it's a hard question. It's like the, it's like the pain point. What's the pain we're trying to solve, I guess, right? And would that's, you, that's always tough. Would the wording that emphasizes the alleviation of, of uh, the hardships, so like maybe instead of accelerating the pace, more like, streamlining and you know eliminating waste so you don't do the same thing over and yeah. over again for different journals yeah it's like that limiting waste thing is like a good yeah and it's, i like that's what i like i mean i don't know everyone else on the call or other researchers but that's a big thing for research it's just like I've, there's just so much waste reformatting things you, changing the reference types because they want a certain style yeah i don't know if you guys have ever gone through it but it's the worst thing in the world so maybe if we position ourselves as kind of like a helpers, right? Okay, we have a few hands, one second. <laughs> Olga was first, I think. Okay, yeah, so another thing I, am, I can think about right now is uh, a lot of publications because of the publication bias are written into the desk drawer, right? So one way to kind of accelerate the pace is by publishing uh, null results somewhere. So we are kind of like not digging the same place again and again and again, looking for the same effects that do not exist. And we do not know that they do not exist because they are written into the desk drawer. So kind of just giving this additional place to inform the field about null results and things that do not work also can in a way accelerate science because you don't have to like come up with the same hypothesis again and like try and prove the same hypothesis again because you already know that it doesn't work for example Shin, what do you wanted to add? Yeah, so um, in, because I'm quite new to here, so pardon me if I'm wrong. But um, first of all, I, I believe the like the speed part um, is should not be a main concern because as a researcher, I do believe the process of peer review is very important. And another thing is from you know going through the community and seeing what's how it's built and reading the white paper. I believe um, the the there are certain points missing even though that we are talking about you know from the researcher side what could be the benefit is that they can get independently found and they can create and publish but also i think um in my understanding the research hub is very much about breaking down the paywall in academia and you know promote the research sharing the community feeling and allow researchers to be curators in web3 that's 
what I'm understanding at this um, stage, but I could be wrong. So I think pro probably our wording um, for the first thing uh, on this page should be, you know, um, at least acknowledging that part. Uh, to dig into that, to that specifically, uh, the breaking down paywalls should be in this tagline. W which piece do you find most compelling? You mean in the, in the mission part? Yeah, in, in this like highlighted, like this sentence here. Yeah, I mean, the pay, accelerate the pace of um, scientific research. Probably we should consider the wording around that. Um, like I said, uh, Personally, I don't feel like pace is the main concern in academic research. Um, I understand that the editorial you know, review process can be a pain, um, but even if we redo that in the research hub and go through you know, the peer review um, process in a quicker speed, that's, that should be a bonus that comes with how we design the scheme within the hub. That's what I'm understanding this. So you personally much rather prefer the angle of open science, correct? Yes, yes, open science and curation, yeah, and community. I'm oh, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm just speaking out loud here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so so what do we want? Do we want to? Ch I think accelerating the pace of scientific discovery has you know been the very prominent. It, it, it's a it's a one liner for research hub for a long time. Patrick, do would we be comfortable with switching into something more you know op open science based and waste elimination based? Oh yeah, totally. This reminds me of like we were looking up mission statements recently, and GitHub's mission statement is something about like empowering everyone to code or something. But then their tagline is the place where the world codes or something. So I, I totally. I think it makes a lot of sense to have a tagline that's not our mission statement that's there is more of like a sales marketing thing to bring people in and mm -hmm. yeah i think what we're doing is uh um like open science curation and like community ownership so i think it makes a lot of sense to do that okay that's a lot of great ideas i'll think of ways to put them together right so the, the, what i hear so far is focus on eliminating waste, focus on the incentive structures. Uh, Scott suggested where research gets rewarded, right? So that's an, that, is that a good tagline? I like it. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, th definitely the incentive structure is perhaps one of the more unique propositions of the research hub. All other things kind of are possible you know, based on the fuel provided by this. Okay. Do we have any more like tangible suggestions for the potential tagline? And I think it makes sense maybe afterwards uh, for Anton to come through this and maybe suggest like one or two more we can all vote on. Yeah, that's what would be awesome if you can come up with uh, any examples of the taglines and share here or in Slack, that would be great. Right. In the meantime, Patrick, do you want to uh, scroll down to the to the things people can do in Research Hub? So this is the question I typically get from people when I introduce them to Research Hub. They're like, well, "Okay, so what? I'm in. What do I do next?" Right. So how would you describe the set of activities people should be able to do in Research Hub? Right now, it's you know post and discuss. The hypothesis feature just basically allows you to summarize a certain claim of whether it's supported or not supported by different research. The ELN feature will allow you to basically crowdsource nodes, maybe share it with select people, discuss it. And then uh, obviously you can use the tokenomics in your advantage to reinforce production of more of the content that you like seeing. And then the specific programs, the power user and the editor programs will allow you to do more specific tasks to get more research going. What do you think should be added here and revised? I think um, one thing I don't see here, and I'm not sure if it's something we should add, is the ability to claim your profile. 
So like, let's say you did, you wrote some paper, you can claim it and get some RSC. Um, just something to consider. So like, basically let people know that you are there and open for discussion as an offer. It's like, uh, so you claim your profile and you earn, get rewarded for that. So it's like, uh, that whole thing. Yeah, but I hear what you're saying, Anton, where it's like the Yelp profile, where like if if the owners of the restaurant are there, you know, you can actually talk to the people uh, who own the mm -hmm. restaurant and like there's advantages there. Um, and it lets the owners of the restaurant communicate with their customers. So I, I do think that's a cool value prop. Could we have like a, a label on papers that have been claimed and the, and the offers have expressed uh, desire to talk to people? We had designs for that, but they haven't made it into the app yet. So I can uh, prioritize that because I do think that should be there. Like, what do you guys think about like, uh, I'm just trying to think, I'm just trying to wrap my head around groups, like grouping, grouping these functions uh, or features into something more digestible. Cause so I think for me, like as I read this, um, I think it's like I'm still trying to I'm still trying to get away like okay so like what is it what is it going to help me do so is it kind of like what is it collaborate you can collaborate um, you can contribute or you can I don't know I don't know help others or something like that just something more high level a little bit one one step higher level and then grouping the features up into like buckets like that because I still have our time get, taking away, like, in one sentence, what does research up to you based on these points? And I think if we can figure out that one sentence, it would help a lot. I don't, I don't know. That's my opinion. No, it's a very good opinion. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, like, a one sentence above in this paragraph, as Joey mentioned, plus uh, the grouping, and then, you know, the features within the grouping would uh, would be very um, helpful. Maybe curate should be a section here too, like Xing said. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Definitely. 100%. So Olga introduced another interesting idea. Maybe we want to have a division for you know, people who produce research and people who want to discuss other people's research, right? So they might, might have different goals and you might want to highlight that both types of people are welcome here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Anton, are you saying have two different, like, one-pagers, maybe depending on what the audience would be? Not, not in the one-pagers, but within the things you can do in Research Hub, kind of like have a separate uh, mini set of goals that would only make sense for people who are actively publishing kind of thing. I don't know, like get feedback on your on your preprint, right, from, from uh, perhaps quality. <laughs> qualified users who know what they're talking about. So kind of like p express peer review. Yeah, maybe like two different boxes. One is for the for your research, the other for research of other people. Like if you are if you want to do something about your research and like put your research on research hub, go here. If you want to just read other people's research and discuss, go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I yeah, I think it makes sense. I think another thing we can consider doing, I don't know if it's a good idea to do yet, but in addition to this, also talk about what of the, are the features we will be building in the future, like peer review, definitely something we're going to do, definitely something we don't have right now. Maybe, like, it depends if this pager wants, if you want to excite people, then yeah, let's put it there. If we want to convey like uh, 
honesty and what we status quo, then may, let's not put it there. So my thought here, and curious what everybody else thinks, but I feel like we should focus this on like, why should I show up to Research Hub today and then update it like as we build new features? It, it's just good from like a legal perspective and then like actually sharing it around, like, you know, why, why should I click on the link to Research Hub? Mm -hmm. like, Makes sense. Uh, Patrick, could you uh, elaborate a little bit, like, because it, you know, I, I, I see research will help as like, you know, they're, if it's like a Web3 platform and you're like connecting the community to researchers with the middleman, per se, so like, or two target user groups would be the community and the researchers, is that kind of understanding? And if we're, if those are two user groups, then like when you're segmenting the community, what, what like specific community members are you targeting? Is it those just interested or is it, yeah. Yeah, totally. So we've kind of been walking like uh, kind of a foot in both camps currently. I know uh, Brian, our CEO, is really interested in making content that like the average person can consume. Um, one, of, one of the challenges there is that you need to actually have really talented people there to create that content. And so I think we need to appeal to researchers first and then maybe help them craft like how they phrase things in a way that's uh, easily digestible. I know like eLife does some things where they like help authors like create like easily understandable titles and like um, uh, layman summaries of their papers. So I think like in terms of what we're hoping to accomplish with this one pager is like recruiting high quality scientists who like can show that like there's like a lot of cool stuff happening on Research Hub. And then once we have that community, um, maybe trying to recruit more of like the consumer, like content consumer bucket afterwards. Th does that make sense to you, Joey? Oh yeah, yeah it does. So you're kind of saying, you're kind of like, so you're, gonna, you're trying to get researchers because they're the ones who's gonna write, but also like critique the work. So you're kind of saying like, they go both ways, essentially. Yeah, totally. Okay. I think um, one of the biggest obstacles, if I were to share a research hub to my colleagues or to my um, peer scholars here around me, is that, you know, the, like what's the selling point? Because if you tell them that you can post and discuss other research papers um, or, you know, post your research paper and claim that those tokens, I think we really need to discuss maybe in the later stage the incentive scheme because from my impression, most researchers do not like to discuss their research papers, especially with people who are not in that niche research area that they share. So if you are, you know, from outside, a little bit outside their research area, and then the questions you pose to them, they might not have the patience to really engage in the discussion, I feel. Um, so I think that's something we need to really discuss later. And perhaps you, to just, yeah. So this you is think, a, think uh, the monetary reward would change that attitude? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure about that, but yeah, I think that's definitely one of the biggest obstacles if I were to be an amb ambassador in academia. Um, perhaps the first group of people that we have better success rate um, will, would be graduate students. Um, if it's a more senior uh, research member in a university, first of all, they are super, super overworked and you know they have less incentive and perhaps they, you know, they are not less they are less motivated to do it they they have other admin jobs teaching responsibilities and you know after a certain stage when you have a security position you just don't feel like to try those things and share outside your comfort zone but for graduate students i think that that's where we should really focus on first before we expand um yeah but that's just what i think at the moment um Yeah, if, I really. If, if you imagine you, you invite a very renowned uh, professor to post his or her research paper, and perhaps someone from who's who's not very familiar in this area asks certain questions. I would imagine that he or she would not be very very interested in posting responses <laughs> to each question, or to 
ask other questions um, from there. Um, per perhaps graduate students should, should, should be more interested and be more incentivized to get the tokens. Because another thing is to explain what is DAO <laughs> to them and what is token reward, etc. Because to them, they might feel like, what? why do I need those tokens? <laughs> and then, you know, um, yeah, it's a lot of work um, compared to explaining to them um, instead of, you know, the younger generation of graduate students. Because they, um, yeah, generally speaking, they, they have more understanding in thousand, you know, tokens. That's very true. Uh, Patrick, should we move on to the next topic for discussion? Because we are running out of time. Yeah, definitely. This, this is a lot of good stuff, too. So I think uh, it gives us a lot to uh, iterate on. Yeah, and make sure if you keep uh, have more thoughts on this, uh, either add comments or edit stuff or send us a message on Slack. All right, so the editor program, the next stage in the reward schemas. Uh, Kobe, can you show the, the designs for that? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, sure. sorry, yeah. sorry, so sorry, Kobe, um, because I, yeah. I need to claim of my personal interest because I'm applying for this editorial program. Actually, I've already submitted, so should I leave uh, at this moment? No, yes, no, no. me too. Okay, <laughs> okay, so, okay. No, this is amazing. But I've already submitted, so I didn't know that, you know, it's too early, so mm -hmm. I should have submitted afterward. After. No, no, that's no. excellent. <laughs> One yeah, of the goals for our early editor program is like it's going to be pretty amorphous, and the more feedback we have from the people who are participating in it, the better off it'll be. So, so yeah, all of the early contributors, like we love your feedback, and it will improve it. So that way, like we're we're better off in the long run as we recruit more people. Yeah. No. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, I think um, as far as the edit program, let me quickly just uh, summarize like one key paragraph, which is why are we doing this? Um, we want to build a community. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, like if you look at any successful like um, startup that turn into something more, it starts with a community. You got to have people and good people. So I think um, if we read this sentence real quick, so a thriving community is the heart of every successful platform and research hub is no different. Editors will play a key role in bootstrapping the research hub community and their job will be like um, a hybrid between an ambassador, a moderator and a traditional uh, journal editor. So they're gonna be participating in scientific discussions. They're gonna help curate quality content and help uh, grow the community. And um, yeah, so that's the gist of it. Now we have preliminary designs, they're not going to be like design wise, it's not going to be like a, a huge leap forward, but there are a few key things we wanted to implement uh, with this editor program. So the first thing we do is to give a sense of ownership to the editors because they're really helping us out. And, um, you know, we want to create like a more sense of professionalism at Research Hub. So we want to highlight the different editors of each hub so this is an example of like, you can all see my screen, right? Yep. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, this is an example of like, um, and designs are in the works, but like just uh, an example of like what it may look like. So here, two editors, so not necessarily one editor, it can have be, a hub can have multiple editors. And another thing we want to do is to create like a sense of community by highlighting the number of users. Um, so that would be like one of the changes. Another couple of small changes um, is gonna be on a profile for profile of, of editors, we would like um, highlight whether the user is an editor. So in this case, you can see the, the this user is an editor of uh, three different hubs. And then the, the final thing that I guess from a tech perspective and design perspective is uh, going to be the most uh, intensive. Um, and the designs here are not fully complete, but just to give you a sense of what that may look like. Let me find it. There's like so many things here. Um, okay, so basically, if you go to our profile page right now, you will see that um, we kind of group things together, uh, contributions together into buckets. So you have like uh, comments and uh, submitted papers and stuff like that. 
it's not really great um, because one of the one of the aspects of the editor program is that uh, you know we want to um, to be able to uh, basically like it's a corollary. It's important for us to showcase like what editors are doing and in general what every other user on the site is doing. And one way we can do this is by fixing our overview page, our profile overview page to be more Reddit like. So if you go to Reddit, like if I click, this is like an example from like a user. So there is like the activity of the user sorted like top to bottom. Um, and, you know, it seems like a simple thing, but that's something we don't have. And we want to um, to help the users by showing like the activity that they contributed, but we want to also show um, help like the community by showing other people what people are doing to contribute to research jobs. So if I click on Joyce's profile, I can see all the things that they, he did. Um, and um, and yeah, so there is like a, a bunch of aspects to it, but that's one of it. Uh, so yeah, any questions? Uh, hopefully that was kind of like straightforward. Looks good, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a lot of work. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. So we can expect like some of these designs to be in place um, by end of next week. Um, yeah, that's what when we're shooting for. Do you? I have a question. So that would be a perfect segue into our discussion of two things, right? So what you you saw that the responsibilities of the editors are they they're not super specific, right? So just do do what's good for your hub, basically, right? So do you think we should be more specific, less specific? Like obviously, you guys are highly motivated individuals since you're here. So, but for other editors, would you want to introduce some sort of you know tangible measurements of the progress or not? I think you need some guidance because you know, like I like for us, like I run a committee that decides like what guidelines to approve uh, for organization and like medical guidelines, and you you have like a bunch of like high, so like very smart people in the room, and they can't even agree on criteria to create these guidelines um and this is like the crux of everything it's like do you are you editing for like a splash like news are you thinking like you want to only do high quality but then what does high quality mean like i i'm biased because i would favor things that are more applicable to practical medicine and then but then some people would say you know lab or wet labs uh, science is important as well um when it comes to medicine and there's the two sides dueling it out versus when you're looking at blood markers versus actual outcomes and how do you fall on that and it's like super debated in the medical world and this is just medicine i don't know how the other specialties are too but even just like a guidance of like you know are you editing for a splash on news because that's okay if that's what the goal is i think just being clear on it would help a lot because uh, you're you're probably not going to get like we're gonna we can try to get tangible things, but it's gonna be super super hard, and I don't know if it's realistic. So you're okay with overarching directions? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and kind of go with the Reddit mentality. You know, you have a subreddit. I don't moderate, but like I assume this is how it is. You have a subreddit. You pick moderators based on interests, and you align the goals. You kind of know what you're moderating for and you have like rules right like there's you should have at least like the stop rules like that you can't do this this and this but the other stuff has to, it's going to be broad and it's going to be really hard because there's going to be, there's gonna be debates too let's say i prove something and patrick says you know like you should have approved that other one you you dismissed as well who gets final say how you determine all that stuff yeah it gets crazy it gets crazy Um, I'm a little bit confused as to how to ensure the quality of the content because um, in, I'm quite used to academia. So if you publish in a very famous and you know uh, top tier journal, then most likely it's quite um, high quality um, research findings. But for probably some work in progress or other 
unpolished paper to be uploaded to the community. The editors cannot look into every paper in detail um, and in every you know um, niche er research area within their hub. So um, and that's not taking into consideration of the peer review process, which is more complicated. So if, even up to now, just the quality assurance part, um, I'm quite confused how you know one or several um, editors can guarantee that. And how can we um, you know, value one paper's quality, if, especially if it's not from your niche research area and that you don't understand um, some part of it? And how, you know, how would we know that the results are re replicable um, and can be tested? And you know, there are not other ethical issues um, related in order to get the token rewards. So I think probably that's a, that's something we need to work in the long term. But I think it's um, useful to note down those areas because um, that could cause a main concern, which is the quality of the research, which is basically the point that we are making here. If we can't guarantee the quality or you know, how to assess the quality there, the scheme up around that, then you know, the more we promote this, the more concern there will be, in my opinion. Um, I don't know about what you guys think. So, so to jump in, that's a great point. Because like in theory, like an editor at a traditional journal is there to kind of be like a quality filter to a certain extent. And so I think the way we should think about this editorial program is going to be like an evolving responsibility set. So right now, our product is kind of closer to Reddit than it is like a scientific journal. And so like for the first stage, I think it's going to be more about like making sure that the papers that are like being talked about in your field are in the hub. So that's going to be basically like finding papers that are relevant and posting them and then like helping to encourage discussion around those papers that is high quality. And so that doesn't necessarily have to be like peer review level quality, but just like cool comments, like making sure that spam is removed, things that are off topic. And so that's that's like the first stage, but we're building out an ELN where eventually authors will be able to like publish preprints yeah. on Research Hub. And then I think the role will evolve towards that more traditional journal type of responsibilities. But yeah, just thinking of like today, what the editors do will probably be different than what they'll do in six months. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Am I right in understanding that even if the uh, one of the users upload an unpublished um, working paper on there, you know, the a discussion around it is the main thing that we should focus on instead of, you know, whether this is quality research or not. Um, because I can see that most of the papers uploaded on Research Hub are published and are on quite good journals. So um, yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, yeah the, quali the quality here is not in the traditional editor quality sense, right? It's, you know, making sure that the, the papers that upload it are not from the, you know, predatory journals that they're, you know, well aware, people well aware of the links are not broken, the titles are not broken, stuff like that. As for the quality of the papers themselves, I think it's okay for papers to be of low quality. We have the upload download mechanism, right? The, the, the community can decide that a certain paper is, you know, not worth mentioning by downloading it, right, to the to the red zone, and that's going to be, you know, not not your headache, the community's headache. Do you think, like, uh, you know, if we're thinking, kind of in phases or like this? try something small and go bigger later like do you think you should kind of make it known to the users like certain hubs are moderated rather than try to get editors for all of them just pick like a few of the big ones um get them moderated figure out our issues that we'll run into i'm sure and then kind of like evolve from there is that what you're thinking maybe you're thinking that already yeah, we are thinking starting small. We do want to get the editors to the most popular hubs. If we can, prioritize those. But obviously, as we grow, ideally, every single hub would have an editor or multiple. And Joey, to kind of expand on that, like we kind of had in mind a few hubs where we'd had some traction, like um, longevity and psychology. But then like we got in touch with Scott, who's a criminologist and has like some criminology friends who are interested. And so like 
I think for the very early stages, it's good to, you know, see where we get traction and then maybe narrow down on the ones where we've got two or three editors that are like contributing high quality content. Cool. All right. Uh, we should probably move on to our next topic, the least, the least nice one. How do we ensure, what would, do you think would be the ideal selection process for the editors? And maybe as a bonus, what do you think should be the format of us, other editors and other contributors to ensuring that the editors who deviate from their assigned role are no longer editors? Right. That's a, that's an unpleasant thing to talk about, but that there should be mechanisms for that, right? What should it be during the community call? Should there be a vote by other editors? What do you guys have in mind? To, to help frame this a little bit more, too, a couple of things we can do is like say you have to have a PhD in the hub that you're editing in order to be like considered for like whatever our selection mechanism is or or like in a PhD program, you know, of that hub. Um, and then we can also do something like a DAO vote. So basically just like anybody who's applied, we can have a DAO vote for each person and then essentially uh, prove or deny from there. Um, it may be hard to have a whole bunch of DAO votes like that, but we, we could give it a shot. And then if that didn't work, maybe do something more casually in the Slack channel. Yeah, Would, I, should we set up? Go ahead. Can I just ask if it's going to be a DAO vote? Um, what about the privacy issues related? Because, um, yeah, for example, am I going to show everyone my CV or my covering letter, etc., or to give um, a brief introduction to the community? In that sense, I think, um, yeah. I think the presentation skills might be more important than a lot of other things. I'm not sure. I haven't ever uh, done something similar like this. So, um, yeah. It's an amazing point. Like, we don't just want people who can speak well to be. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, absolutely. I think it makes sense. Like, maybe we can refine the form to have like a quick bio, like a required bio to say, like, this is what will be voted upon. And you can say, like, why you think you'd be a good editor. And then that's presented um for the DAO vote portion what do you guys think yeah i think that's fair totally i think um if we go from the selection process i think um, perhaps it it depends on each hub's application amount and you know the candidates in there so it might be quite different in medicine or compared to business finance and based on the pool of applicants perhaps we could have relaxed or more strict selection um, process. And for example, um, you guys said at, the, at this moment, it's very much like Reddit um, on here and less on the recent research intensive, like the knowledge part. So perhaps that required more, you know, um, organizing around the community and the, the passion, the time you can contribute. Whereas if we develop into the next stage, we might want someone with more expertise in the area and you know, more research networks who can you know, bring in more um, users or more you know, um, interesting discussions on the table. So I think it depends on the pool of the candidates and the hub itself, and also um, the different stages of that. Perhaps it varies a lot uh, for the stage part um, for each hub. I'm not sure about the statistics behind that on the backstage, but yeah, um, perhaps we should make you know that into consideration. I mean, would would the DAO uh, kind of satisfy this evolution of requirements, right? Because we we would vote now, and we would have a different criteria in mind compared to the same vote a year from now. Hmm. So we don't need to have a permanent set of criteria, right? They will evolve over time. I think you're right, Anton. And we could like list in the DAO vote, be like how many current moderators are in this hub. So if it's like the first person applying to be an editor, you know, that might just inherently cause people to socially have less stringent um, like requirements versus like, is this the 10th editor? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, for sure. And then we, that that's what I'm afraid of that we some hubs will get overpopulated pretty fast and we will have to do something about it. Okay, so we'll need to figure out it, it seems DAO is the acceptable solution for everyone. Looks that way. So we will have to figure out a way how to do it logistically. <laughs> but that's up to us. Do, do we think there should be some set in stone minimum requirement too, whether that's like being in a PhD program or something like that? Hard to say, right? Because across different countries, the PhD program might not mean the same thing. Like being in a PhD program, like in my previous PhD program, it was it, I was in a very different role than what I am now, but I had the same title. Yeah, and then is there going to be verification if you start doing limit these things, right? That's that's a whole other hard thing to solve. Yeah. I'm probably being too traditional because I'm from academia, but I do find you know some qualifications are very useful or publications or at least evidence of your ongoing projects or you know working paper at least you know otherwise it will raise concern in the community to let someone who is le much less mm -hmm. uh, knowledgeable in the area to run this community you know if if we invite like professors or more renowned scholars to join us um it won't be very convincing yeah okay what if we do what if we do the same thing they do in the application for the grad program? What if you are required to provide a writing sample, like something you worked on the majority of it? You, there might have been contributors who who edited that, but you were the first author. It might be a poster, might be a paper, might be a proposal. Doesn't matter. Something just to show us the gist of how you handle things. But who's gonna? value that the, the DAO. Okay. <laughs> the DAO, we'll read it. <laughs> what if we also I'm, I'm thinking like like joey brought up a good point where it's easy for me to write text but it's you know you might not necessarily be the real person behind it what if um you, you just have to pass a quick 10 minute interview with either anton myself some other community member where you get vouched for by someone like another editor who says, yeah, this person is most likely the person they say they are. I got on the phone with them. I saw them. You know, we talked about their field. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I know as much as like I love like decentralization, like it's like it's still new territory, and it's it's like a good like backup plan, you know, in case you know, in case you can, you'll catch that initially, right? Okay, so just to reiterate, we want so is it a yes or a no for requiring you know, masters plus, right? Basically. Yes, for me. I think so. Yeah. It's actually yeah, I think so. Okay. Ma masters plus uh, and the interview with either me or Patrick. Yep. Okay. And the DAO finalizes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, that sounds good. You should probably add it to the editor uh, program page, the requirements of uh, you know, being, essentially being in a, a graduate program or above. I'll sync with you after, Anton, and we can we can work that into the copy. Okay. All right. Uh, should we discuss something else? Are we that were the, all the topics we plan to go through? I guess Pre the, the last thing is removal. So, for instance, like yeah. I think removal should pretty much only be an activity. So, like you shouldn't earn tokens if you don't do anything the previous month. So, so maybe like two weeks of inactivity with the notification that's not responded to. Like one of us reaches out and there's no response, and then another two weeks means removal or a DAO vote? Should there be a DAO vote for removal or just pure inactivity? I think inactivity should just be an, an, an automatic drop, right? We can't get a hold of, of, of the person, but we could probably bring in more controversial cases to the DAO vote, right? Because they, 
what is the person shows up once every two weeks and does one thing, right? That's technically not an activity. We don't have a strict set of things to do, right? So we can't really judge on that. Yeah, I can also imagine a situation where a person is incapable of, you know, performing anything for two weeks. So maybe inactivity can like put a hold on it, like not automatically remove, but put in a hold on it until further notice. One thing Brian mentioned when we first talked about this idea is even if you get removed, it doesn't preclude you from reapplying. So like if you get removed, no biggie, you know, life happens, like you can just reapply and then get re, you know, like uh, approved by the DAO. Yeah, so that also works. This is interesting. We want... This is going to be, it's going to be like, uh, I'm actually just curious, have you, have you guys ran a DAO vote yet? Or is this, will this be like the first DAO vote? Informally, just from taking polls, but yeah, we haven't used Snapshot yet, so. Okay. okay. We, we plan on having a couple coming up here. All right, any free form comments before we conclude the meeting? I'm not sure about taking away coins as a punishment. I feel like it's a little bit unfair if you're like taking away coins you already earned as a fine. So more of like just freezing the account maybe. Yeah, I think like, uh... It sounds like to, because like, you know, we the researchers come from a very hierarchical um, organization, just structure and everything. Like I, I think like it'd be useful to have some sort of, some tools at least for the editors themselves so they can manage themselves. Like, you know, I'm going to be away for X amount of months on a sabbatical for whatever reason, you know, like stuff like that happens. And it's like, okay, freeze, is there like, can I, do I freeze my account? Do I say, Patrick, hey, can you find another editor to cover for me? You know, like, I can see those, those come up. Because, yeah, we just it's just very hierarchical uh, where, where we, we all kind of work from. And it's we're used to having a boss, and that boss is used to having a boss, et cetera. Yeah. Maybe it also might make sense to require people to be part of the community Slack in the editor channel. So that way, like, people are easily contacted. And like, if there are issues, like it's easy to reach out to somebody else in your hub to let them know and we can spread the word. Yeah, we can also organize some kind of like editorial meeting once a week or once to two weeks or once uh, whatever time frame it is. So people are should be present on it or they should have some kind of notice why they're not present on it. Yeah, we should definitely add that to the requirements. Like, like at least once monthly, you need to show up to like the general editorial meeting or like hub specific. Once we have enough people, agreed. Cool. Yeah, this is awesome. Anton, thank you for leading. These are all really good ideas. Thanks everybody for showing up. I think this is like our most productive community call <laughs> like in a couple of months. So this is awesome. Yeah, excited. Th thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks for uh, just the meeting time. That was helpful for me at least. <laughs> good. Awesome. All right, guys, have a good night. Uh, and I'll see you guys on Slack. See you later. Thank you, Bye, guys. Everyone. Nice to meet you. Bye. Yeah. Bye.